Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you live in Australia, I'm doing two live events with Josh Zepps at the end of August. The first one is in Sydney on August 25th, and the second is in Melbourne on August 28th. So if you live in Australia or you happen to be visiting, please grab a ticket at the links in the description. They're selling fast. Once again, that's August 25th in Sydney and August 28th in Melbourne. Okay, my guest today is Glenn Lowry. Glenn Lowry, as most of you will know, is one of my intellectual heroes, and along with John McWhorter, one of the people indirectly responsible for my existence as a public intellectual. He is an economist at Brown University and a podcaster at The Glenn Show. His recently published memoir is called Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. In the episode, Glenn reflects on his early days growing up on the South Side of Chicago. We talk about how the South Side has changed since he was a kid. We talk about the causes and consequences of the unraveling of the black family throughout the 20th century. We talk about the foundational debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois and how their opposing philosophies have fared with hindsight. Glenn talks about the influence of Thomas Sowell in his life and much more. So without further ado, Glenn Lowry. Okay, Glenn Lowry, thanks so much for doing my show. Good to be here, Coleman. You are someone who needs no introduction on this podcast, though. As a formality, I will um, I'll, I'll record one uh, later. But the occasion of this particular conversation is is your book, your memoir, Late Admissions: um, Confessions of a Black Conservative, by Glenn Cartman Lowry. Uh, it's a it's a incredible book. I often feel that memoirs are um, much more compelling to read for me than uh, than books of argumentation, in particular when someone has had uh, a life that really defies um, defies expectations. You know, I felt this way reading Thomas Sowell's memoir. I felt this way reading Christopher Hitchens' memoir. And I felt that way reading your memoir, and I cannot advise enough, even for people that are highly familiar with you, your life, and your work, to go out and actually do yourself the favor of just getting the book, read the whole thing. Um, and um, so first, I want to just ask you what it was like for you as a person to actually reflect and try to recall even <laughs> you know, all the events of, of your life. Um, what was the experience like of of going back and remembering these scenes from early childhood, from 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 adolescence, and so forth? It was very powerful. Uh, I had a series of conversations uh, that I recorded in which I, I basically was being interviewed about my life, and uh, I actually used those conversations in order to to finally get words down on paper. But uh, the experience, you know, the experience of remembering my mother in all her glory, uh, the, the experience of trying to describe why I was so admiring of my father as a disciplined man, as a, a man of, you know, who had, who had control. Uh, so the, the reliving of, you know, my time in uh, a mental hospital being treated as an inpatient for drug addiction or the humiliating embarrassment of being exposed as a, you know, philandering, you know, keeping a mistress, you know, being accused of assaulting her. I mean, I I know this is a lot to just be pouring out to your audience at one time, <laughs> but you asked me what was it like to to relive and going into my interior thoughts. You know, I mean, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? Um, it 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 was a a, a, po- a powerfully galvanizing experience. I mean, there were layers. To it, I, I discovered things uh, uh, about myself. I, I, I exposed things to myself about myself in going through the process. It was a long time coming as well. I mean, it was 
I, you know, I didn't sit down and just write this narrative in one, in one go. I, I was on leave from Brown 2015, 16 at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford as a fellow. And this book was my project, but it, it somehow didn't really come together for me. But, uh, you know, I created uh, drafts and sketches and notes and, you know, various theoretical flights of fancy, but I didn't actually have a book. Uh, so I, I've been I've been at this for a while. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you know, there are so many moments in your life story that were clearly painful to live because they're painful to read. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's painful to imagine at some of your lowest low moments where, you know, as you mentioned, you're, um, you know, you, you're, you're being discovered by your wife as having fathered a child by another woman. Um, you know, you're answering for your drug addiction, uh, uh, you know, all, all along this um, really inspiring story of st- you know, starting out your, your first like real decent job was at, 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 a, at a factory, really um, working basically a menial job that that many people could do in, in theory, at least um, to rising to the highest heights of prestige that are on offer in American society. So and, and yet it's sort of punctuated with all of these moments of personal um, points of, of, of shame in, in a way. Uh, I'm curious, like at, at these points in your life, these low points, did it did it ever occur to you that you were living a life interesting enough to, or that 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 one day your life would be so interesting so as to be able to write a memoir and have, you know, tons of people interested in, in reading it? No, I, as things were developing, no, I didn't have that degree of distance from myself and kind of objectivity i mean the way you put it is is apt um you know i i i was working in a factory i was married i had two children uh and i was attending a community college before i got discovered by one of my professors there and sent out to northwestern university they took me in as a inner city scholarship kid and uh it was uh like night and day transformation for me intellectually and personally to discover I was really good at math. Uh, I liked reading thick and hard to understand books that I could express myself with precision and elo- eloquence. Uh, and, and that I, you know, in a modern library in a, a great university could spend months just wandering in the stacks, pulling stuff down and exposing myself to this or that great idea or whatever. And and this was like a miraculous transformation for me. And I go from a community college student in 1970 with a wife and two kids to a PhD in economics from MIT in 1976 to a full professor at Harvard in 1982. And a little more than a decade, I had, I had made that, uh, that, that kind of a move. And no, I wasn't, self-aware enough to be thinking about myself, man, that would make for a pretty good uh, cinema uh, (laughs) script or something like that. I mean, no, in retrospect, you know, when I finally did get the idea that I'm going to write a book about my own life uh, and start taking it seriously. uh, And I would say that was 10, 12 years ago. uh, I, I thought I had, good material to work with. I, I, I thought it's a, you know, <laughs> it's a rich understand. tableau, <laughs> but at the time, not so much. So, you know, you, you grew up on the South side of Chicago. Now I was, I was born in, in the mid nineties. And by the time I was of age to pay attention, even passingly to the news or, you know, read, uh, commentary that it became clear to me very quickly that the south side of chicago was a kind of code word for everything that's fucked up about inner city um black inner cities in particular it's a it's a kind of shorthand for talking about every inner city in in the country because it is considered the quintessential example it's the first place people list when they talk about the crime and the inner city, inner city problem, for example, South side of Chicago, and everyone knows what you mean by it. 
Um, I'm curious, you know, when you were growing up in, in the South side of Chicago in a very different era, really in, in, in the sixties, uh, and, and a little, little earlier, what was it like and how do you account for th- you know, any transformation between the South side of Chicago that you n- knew a- as a kid and the South side of Chicago that became the watchword for inner city, you know, de- degeneration. Yeah, that, that's a, a good thing to talk about. Uh, because I, I know what you mean when you say the South side of Chicago is iconic in, in exemplifying uh, the urban failure, black urban pathology, you know, crime, carjackings, homicide, gangs, uh, and inner city decay. And you say you were born in the 90s, and I think it probably already had advanced very much in that direction by then. I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and that's a long time ago. Uh, And it was different. I mean, you, you had good neighborhoods and you had bad neighborhoods on the South Side, you know, and good neighborhoods were, were quite okay. I mean, in the street that I uh, grew up on in my mother's sister's house that we lived upstairs in the back, I, as a kid, slept on the living room couch. I didn't have a bed. Uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment. My sister and I were too old to share a bedroom. She had the bedroom. I had the front room closet and the couch. And uh, this was a small apartment upstairs in the back of my Adi Lois's house, which was a grand house. They had carved out a little apartment upstairs, a kind of au pair suite upstairs in the back and made a two-bedroom apartment out of it. But, you know, I slept on the couch. But I never heard gunshots. There were no drug vials or paraphernalia in the gutter. You could leave your bicycle on the lawn in the backyard and nobody would climb over the fence and take it and ride away with it. There were fruit trees. People kept their lawns nice on this street. The street had bungalows, little small, single-family detached houses, and low-intensity apartment buildings, two flats, three flats. There might be a six-flat apartment building with a courtyard where three apartments on either side. That's as, that's as uh, tenement-like as it got in that neighborhood. Now, you could go a mile to the west from Park Manor, the community that I lived in when I was a kid, across the Dan Ryan Expressway, an interstate divided, uh, uh, limited access highway, to another neighborhood still on the south side. And the the, uh, architecture was different. The nature of life on the streets was different. The people were different. It was not a good neighborhood. There was more crime. There were hookers on the street. There was open uh, drinking at the Honky Tonk Tavern, people spilling out onto the sidewalk with brown paper bags. There was louder music. It was rougher. Still the South Side. I have the impression, my son still lives in Chicago, on the South Side, my son Alden, uh, that most of the South Side is like those bad neighborhoods where when I was coming up in the 1950s and 60s and worse. Um, So I watched the TV show the shy, you know, the, uh, Paramount, uh, series and, uh, set in Chicago. I, I'm, I'm behind. I think the show was, uh, filmed in the late teens, you know, 2017, 18, 19 or whatever, but it's set in Chicago and, uh, on the South side. And I recognize the neighborhoods, the street signs, the, uh, elevated, uh, uh train tracks, uh, the architecture, the, what the buildings look like. But I don't recognize the society. I mean, it's a completely different world. Mm. Yeah, this is a, a a topic I've been interested in because of my interest in the issue of you know racial inequality. There is this literature on why it is the case that the black family broadly was quote unquote intact, meaning most black kids before 1950, 1940, were growing up in two-parent households, uh, which was very surprising to me when I first read it. I actually didn't believe it wow. because it, it's it's such a 
ubiquitous phenomenon my whole life that 60, 70 percent of 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 black kids are, you know, grow up in out of wedlock homes. It was difficult for me to imagine a reality in which that number was closer to 10 or 20 percent. Uh, as it is, you know, you're born into the world, you assume things have always been the way that they are. So to, to read uh, Herbert Gutman's, you know, book, meticulously detailing the fact you look at black families right after the Civil War, you have 80 percent, you know, 80 percent of kids are in two parent households, not so far off from the number among, among white Americans for something like 80 years. And the data actually looks pretty convincing, right? It's like, uh, and then you see, uh, you know, I, I think I saw a video of a random street corner in Harlem in like 1920 or something. And every single black person walking on the street is like actually just dressed like the Hollywood recreation of, of movies from that era. Like everyone is dressed nicely. And having year, ha- having lived for four, four years in Harlem, that's like, that's impossible. I can see how a Hollywood producer would create that set because it's, oh, you know, people dress like this. But then to actually see video of it and, and to think that people actually, like everyone dressed well to leave the house um, is, is really amazing to contemplate the, the cultural difference between that era in black America and, and today. On the other hand, I, 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 I've also had this thought of, you know, what if there there were similar issues of, you know, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, what if on paper people were married, but behind the scenes there was all kinds of chaos as well, and the chaos uh, was just not the kind of chaos it's easy to to see in census figures, right? And so maybe maybe not as much is is different than would meet the eye. I'm curious what you have to say about that issue, have, having lived kind of long enough to, to see different versions of Black America. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I came along in the 50s and 60s. It was a big deal in 1965 when Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, published that infamous and, well, discussed report, the Negro family, the case for national action in which he was alarmed to note that 20, 25% of kids born to a black woman were born to a woman without a husband. And based upon his own, that is Moynihan, the the late Senator Moynihan, then a a bureaucrat working in the labor department under President Johnson, producing a report that he thought was going to be for internal eyes only, but it ended up getting leaked and became a, 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 a cause celeb and and uh, a, a object of ridicule and, and denunciation because he talked candidly about what was going on in the black family. But he was 20, 25% is what he was looking at. And he was willing to conclude on the basis of that, this is what made this thing so explosive, that Johnson, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, uh, War on Poverty, Anti-Discriminating Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, the hope that the Negro, quote-unquote, would become free of full citizen, that that whole project was jeopardized. It it wasn't clear that you could achieve the objectives of integrating the Negro, quote unquote, into the uh, body uh, politics slash economic uh, if you didn't somehow address the family. He was willing to talk about putting on extra shifts at the post office so you would employ more Negro men, again, quote, uh, because at that time, the idea that a man would be a more attractive partner if he had a good paying job and that that might help to heal whatever the breach was between men and women that was producing this alarming 25 percent. OK. And as you know, uh, looking today, you're talking 70 percent, 75 percent. And the best that people can say about it is, well, nuclear family is not the only way of raising kids. And, uh, you know, don't be a respectability politics prude. Uh, cultural argument itself, is it respectable in our time? I mean, if I were to say this is the root of the problem, and that to me, that's a defensible sociological position, sociological slash historical position. The root of the problem is cultural. The collapse of internal cohesion, how children get socialized, how men and women deal with other reverence for tradition 
a concern for the opinion, the decent opinion of your fellows, dignity, these kind of things. I think they, or the lack thereof, are the root of the problem. But to argue in that fashion in our time is to be laughed out of court. No one will take you seriously. They'll call you a, a Christian if you happen to have any kind of religious sensibility, a prude. You're not with the most uh, fashionable, latest, postmodern abandonment of traditional institution. You think that has anything to do with the race problem? Uh, the, the propaganda of Black Lives Matter turns its complete back on the things that I'm affirming here. So I'm sorry to get exercised, but I, I, I think uh, I've actually lost track of what your <laughs> original yeah. question was. <laughs> no, you're answering it uh, obliquely. It, it's, you know, like, what what is your vantage point on the the unraveling of, of black family statistics over the past hundred years. Is it the crux of the issue? Is it, re- is it, is it really the case that in 1920, the societies Gutman is looking at in his book are, um, much he- is a m- much healthier version of black America that we have lost? Or is it that those statistics weren't capturing all of the, the chaos, chaos that was present at the time? I think it's the former that it, something was lost, though I think it's a prudent uh, cautionary re- reflex that you exhibit to say, don't take things at face value. Just because the form was a certain thing doesn't mean the substance was a certain thing. And and I think the, the quote-unquote collapse in the form that we've seen since 1950 might, to a certain degree, betray something that was always already there, but that uh, only with the promptings of, you know, the incentives from great society welfare programs or the liberation of women and the complete sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s uh, or, or the um, uh, uh, kind of uh, sexual, uh, I, I guess I'll be repeating myself, uh, that, that it set loose something that was already there, you know, waiting to, to be set loose within black culture that then manifested itself. Everything wasn't peaches and cream. Uh, My own story kind of says that. I mean, here advocating traditional family and whatnot. And yet, you know, in my life, I, I, and and in my background, uh, there was a plenty, there was plenty of behavior and uh, tendencies and orientations and uh, so on patterns that were, that were contrary to that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give the secrets of my book away, you know, Confessions of a Black Conservative, for free. I want people to actually read the book and be be prompted to read it by, by being teased here with my uh, uh, oblique reference to uh, early signs of the kind of collapse of uh, traditional living patterns that we've witnessed in a large part of Black America. I think those signs were there, so I, I, I think you're right to be alert to that. But I think there was something more wholesome. I, there's a book that I love by a guy called Scott Davis. Uh, the book is called The World of Patience Gromes, G-R-O-M-E-S. She was uh, a daughter of a land-owning African-American family in the Virginia Hill country in the late 19th century. And she grows up a princess, you know, playing the piano, ballet lessons or whatever. She, she's a respectable Negro woman. And she marries and she moves to Richmond, Virginia, and she has children and the children grow up and the neighborhood is uh, respectable. I keep using that word, but I mean, that was really an important part of the ethos. I mean, the reason that people are dressed so well on the streets of Harlem in those old clips that you're looking at is they, they had a, a sense of pride and, and they were you know, and, and a questing for dignity and, and a respectability. But in any case, the world of patience groans chronicles the collapse of the Richmond, Virginia neighborhood that this woman who comes to be an old woman, has children, has grandchildren, is living in exactly the same house. And it was a house that her husband built practically with his own hands. Her husband, who was uh, working on the railroad uh, as a porter, it was a very high quality job. This was a very classy family, but everything kind of collapses around them. So by the time you get to the 1950s, 
uh, it's a completely different world. The world of patients groans is gone. Uh, it, it, that's just an anecdote. It's one case, but uh, I, I think something was lost. That, that was what you asked me. And yes, I, I think something was lost. So what, uh, I mean, I, one model of what happened is if you consider black America and white America as two quasi separate societies, uh, you know, that are living in close concert sometimes you can model black America, black America at the time as, as a society that was closer to closer to chaos than white America was. In, in other words, when you pull the string, black American society was, was closer to unraveling than white American society at the time would have been. And so what you can see superficially as two pretty stable societies, um, you know, one can be more vulnerable to the intervention of kind of cultural, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, libertine kind of philosophy, um, so, something, a, 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 a loosening of norms around sexuality and marriage and all of that. And so you get, you can get in the 60s and 70s, a dramatically different unraveling where black America, the, the marriage rate simply goes from like, you know, 80% to like, you know, 30%. Uh, and you see a far more modest decline among white Americans and much less of the subsequent, uh, you know, crime problems with crime and addiction and so forth. I mean, does that model seem like it might be basically correct? I think that's clever. Uh, I think it is plausible. It, it rings true to me. In fact, uh, the idea is you have common shocks, common external effects like the presence of welfare programs, where uh, in the early days, you know, the woman was discouraged from having a stable relationship with the man in order to be eligible to get the support for her child. Uh, and moreover, before the child comes along, the woman could rely on the fact that even if the man doesn't come through and I'm saddled with the child, I know that the cost of that to me will be underwritten to a certain degree by the public provision. That's a shock. That's a the advent of that set of social policies through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is common to everybody. But the effects of that by demographic, by racial demographic, racial slash class demographic, might be really very different. And the common shock could lead to the development of very different patterns of, uh, of behavior within these subpopulations. I think that's I think that's uh, more than plausible. I, I, I think there's a good case for it. I would emphasize not only the racial dimension of that, uh, I would say that if cultural elites uh, who are trendy and coastal and postmodern in their sensibility, they don't think much about marriage, they're libertines as far as sex and drugs and that kind of thing is concerned, uh, they, they have whatever their most recent enthusiasms might be uh, that are whatever they are. And they get projected because they have the me megaphone. They control what's on the TV and the, the, the movie screens, the sensibility of the elite journalists, the kind of tenor of the culture is set by them. And uh, they do drugs when they're young. Uh, they have a lot of, of unprotected uh, sex and, and a lot of uh, come and go relationships. And, 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 and they, they're free. They're, they're liberated. That might uh, cause them some problems early in life, but those are problems perhaps from which they and their children can recover. It might be a lot harder for somebody who's living in a dying Midwestern town where the factory has closed or the mine is no longer functional, uh, the whatever, whatever. The, those same orientations might produce consequences in the lives of those people from which they don't recover. Uh, they don't have the uh, uh, human and social capital resources. They don't have the financial resources. They don't have the uh, uh, dexterity uh, and the wherewithal to be able to uh, take on the consequences of those behaviors and then remedy them. Then you get you get uh, a bigger hit, a bigger negative hit uh, at the bottom end. So I, I just modify your suggested model by saying I think it doesn't only apply to race. Right. 
I mean, this is, so, isn't it Charles Murray's argument in that book, uh, Coming Apart? Uh, it's, isn't it Robert Putnam's argument in his book, Our Kids? Putnam, the political scientist at Harvard, Murray, the, the famous author of The Bell Curve, who's a conservative social critic. But in his book, Coming Apart, I mean, he's saying, it, you know, it's not about race at all, that book. It's, it's about class and it's about the very different lives lived by people in American society, white people in his case, who are located in different positions in the class structure in terms of marriage, lo uh, 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 longevity, uh, education, uh, drug addiction, and uh, other kinds of uh, social pathology. Uh, and I think in a way it's also Robert Putnam's argument in, in our kids that uh, the disparity and the ability to cope with the vicissitudes of the modern social world across different class locations in American society is a very important uh, feature of, 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 our, of our time. Yeah, I think that that rings true to me that, it, you know, if you grow up middle or upper middle class, you you have much more leeway to experiment with drugs, with sex, with all of these kinds of, uh, all of these phenomena um, without really paying lifelong consequences for doing so. Um, I mean, I think of my own, my own parents, for instance, my dad grew up middle class in a very stable neighborhood. Uh, my mom grew up in the South Bronx, um, which to our earlier point, it also at, at a certain point, I think was before I was born, but was kind of like code was talked about very much how, how the South side of Chicago is talked about today um, with good reason. And they they had very different attitudes, you know, toward, towards us growing up. So, it, you know, if, if me or one of my siblings was, you know, drinking in high school or smoking a little weed in high school, my mom would absolutely freak out because to her drugs equaled the crackheads she grew up around, many of whom ended up dead or, or in prison. Whereas my dad, having grown up in a, in a suburban location, had a, a certain knowledge that, you know, high school kids do these things and it's not the end of the world, actually. And uh, in a way, they're both right because, they, you know, my mom had the proper attitude for someone that wanted to get out of the South Bronx successfully was you basically have to be a Nazi about avoiding every temptation, right? Um, and my dad had a, the proper attitude of being a, you know, a relaxed but also ambitious suburban kid where you can experiment a little bit and probably, you know, like worst case scenario, okay, you know, you'll get sent to the police station and you'll be there for an hour, but probably, you know, your dad knows someone who knows someone who's going to talk to the cop and, you know, it's going to be okay. So I, I think that definitely rings true to me. Let's talk about, um, you know, I f another aspect of your story I found interesting is that when you got to Northwestern, um, you, you were recommended as part of this program for sending bright inner city kids to uh, really good schools out of your community college. And you found when you got there, the kind of black kids that were at Northwestern, these were black kids that came from more privilege than you did. Um, they, they were not you know, th th they were not really from mostly the working class side of Chicago that that you knew, uh, and and they had a kind of um, entitlement and sense sense uh, they lacked a sense of wonder that you had um, at, at, with Northwestern with uh, reading. You, you speak of reading Nietzsche and and really you know, breathing it in and, and, and loving every moment of it. And they sort of had this attitude, this blase attitude that, it, you know, wasn't such a big deal. So can you talk a little bit about um, what it was like, you know, what that experience did, did to you? Yeah. And in retrospect, you know, I might've had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. I might've been jealous of these kids. Mm -hmm. I was a little older. I was a transfer student. I had dropped out of college my first time through. My girlfriend got pregnant, got pregnant again. We married. We had two kids now, and I'm working a full-time job. We've, we've discussed this. Uh, and I'm at the community college, and uh, Professor Andres, the uh, wonderful calculus teacher uh, who was an alumnus of Northwestern, uh, flagged me as a worthy uh, recipient of one of their scholarships for inner-city kids to come out to Northwestern. So I end up at Northwestern. I'm on campus. 
uh, I'm showing up at eight, eight thirty in the morning with uh, jeans, uh, boots, uh, flannel, uh, you know, with a pocket protector with the pin and whatnot, and kind of a lunch pail. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, getting off of the uh, public transit or walking a half mile from where I had to park my car because there's no parking right near the center of campus in order to get to my class on time. These kids, and the kids I'm talking about are the black kids who are my peers. Maybe they're uh, uh, two or three years younger than me or four years younger than me, but they're my peers. Are rolling out of their uh, dorm room or their frat house bed, you know, and kind of coming to class in their pajamas practically. And, you know, on the weekend, their dad is coming with a bins to pick them up and they're going, you know, wherever they're going. And they, they're carefree. Uh, they're mostly upper middle class I mean, there were another kids, some kids like, you know, from Chicago and whatnot, like me, but most of the black kids were, their, their parents were doctors and lawyers and uh, teachers and uh, whatnot. And uh, I chose in my memoir to highlight some dimensions of my contestation with, with them and I'm sure they might have been oblivious to the contestation. It might have been a contestation going on largely within my own imagination. Uh, yeah, I, I came there full of wonder. Uh, I, I came there uh, discovering something about myself, which was I, I had gifts and talents for in certain kinds of intellectual work. And there was a vast, unexplored territory for me in the you know, political theory and history and literature in uh, politics and economics, in mathematics, which was my major, I, I was in awe of the place. And uh, I was estranged from my co-racialist uh, on class grounds. Uh, and, and there was this thing that was going on. I mean, everybody was a radical. Everybody, you know, it's black power. It was anti-war. Uh, it, it was the early, early stirrings of identity politics. Ethnic studies was then a revolutionary demand. We demand a black center. We demand, we demand, we demand. And, you know, uh, I was going home to an apartment with a wife and kids in it. I was going to a job 40 hours a week while I was doing this. So maybe I didn't have the luxury of their politics. Maybe I didn't have the idealism uh, of it. Maybe it was tempered by the daily grinding encounters that I had to endure with reality. Uh, I had a lot of sympathy for the attitude of the union member, mostly white ethnic, uh, working class uh, people in the factory where I was a clerk, but I encountered these guys daily. Um, they weren't Trump voters, although they might be Trump voters if they, today, if they were around today. They, they, they weren't, what I'm saying is, ideological conservatives, but they didn't like the, the uh, privileged, entitled, full serious politics radicalism of, of the campus uh, uh, culture of that time, and neither did I. Uh, the black kids were playing bidwits in the, in the student center. They were, they were lounging on the beach uh, over by Lake Michigan. Uh, they were blasé. Uh, and when you put on top of that this kind of contempt for Western culture, which I thought was like a wondrous thing that I was discovering, this kind of smugness, uh, you know, uh, in the, about reading books by dead white men, which I thought was infantile, seriously. I, I thought it was... Uh, so anti-intellectual as to as to be beneath contempt. Yeah, I used Nietzsche as an example, but there was a ton of stuff like that for me. I was doing real mathematics. I was doing real mathematical logic. I knew who Kurt Gödel was when I was at Northwestern University in my senior year and uh, taking a math logic course, the incompleteness theorem and whatnot. These were all new things for me. And I, I wanted to... Uh, share that enthusiasm. I wanted to share it with some of my co-racialists, and I found myself frustrated time and again when I attempted to do so. But again, I did have a massive chip on my shoulder. Hmm. 
It's interesting. I mean, it, like you, your life and my life are so different in a, in a million different ways, but I, I had a similar attitude when I was at Columbia in a couple different ways. One was that, um, when it came to the, the other black kids on campus that would, you know, I would read the newspaper and they would say they're suffering white supremacy every day on campus. Right. They would talk about the legacy of slavery, the African-American experience and, and all, all this, all this stuff. There was a part of me that wanted to tell them, first of all, most of you are African immigrants. Your, par your parents are Ghanaian and Nigerian. I can tell from your last name. Like you, you may think that you, maybe you can fool like the, the white kids that, that you're somehow steeped in the African-American experience and you know about the legacy of slavery firsthand or whatever, but you don't. You're, you, you have an immigrant experience. Why not just be honest and speak to that because that's a very interesting and beautiful thing too. Whereas I, at, at least, you know, on my father's side, feel I do know something about the African-American experience. I, you know, grew up playing black music, uh, having lots of black friends. And at least as a comparative point, I felt that I felt no sense of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the kids writing in the newspaper about white supremacy and the black experience. I, I felt... And, and I also felt at some level, I know the private school you went to was just as white as the one I went to. <laughs> so l let's actually be honest here about what our particular experiences of privilege have been rather than um, perform, essentially, perform a, a, a popular kind of performance for the white kids around us. And then, and then on, the, uh, you know, on my Hispanic side, I felt that I grew up, you know, between the ages of zero and 12, spending a lot of time with my Puerto Rican family in the Bronx. My parents would drop me off there sometimes for, you know, when they needed to do whatever it was that they were doing. And my grandma didn't speak English and I had to sit there with her all day and, you know, be with her and be with all the other Puerto Rican people from the neighborhood coming in and out of her house. She would cook for everybody or whatever. I wasn't there all the time, but I was there enough to feel like I had pretty good connection intuitively to at least Puerto Rican Bronx, New York culture, let's call it. And so when I felt the Hispanic kids at Columbia were doing this Latinx thing, right? This, um, this kind of, this radical politics that I knew they would be made fun of if they went home. <laughs> I knew that this was not a performance for fellow Hispanics. It was a performance that was only popular in the context of a white, progressive, upper-class, Ivy League environment. So I felt like, can we be honest about that? Can we be honest about that's what this is? Um, it's a performance of authenticity that would not do well, that would get booed in the authentic places that we all come from. And I knew that. And I don't know why I had such a chip on my shoulder about the whole thing that, uh, that might require some psychoanalysis of, of me, but <laughs> I, I definitely related to in a very different way, what you, what you felt. That's very interesting, Coleman. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. A couple of other questions I, I wanted to ask you. Um, so it, it turns out just a few hours before we recorded this, I ran into a friend of mine completely randomly on, on the ferry. And I asked him how he's doing and he comes up to me and he says, he breaks down in tears, oh. says he's an alcoholic and he's struggling. Um, he's three days sober. He just had a horrible situation. He has a kid. Oh. And, and so it's, and he, he broke down, you know, hugging me and, and I, I didn't know what to tell him other than to give some words of encouragement but I'm, I'm curious, you know, wh what is your vantage point on addiction um, and conquering it as, as someone who has been there and can speak to it and has lived on sort of both sides of sobriety? Um, what is it that you've learned that, <laughs> if, if anything, that you can offer to people struggling with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a tall order, that question. I do, of course, delve 
at length into my own uh, struggles with addiction. I, I was using crack cocaine in the late 1980s and 1987. Uh, 1986, 1987. I, actually, I didn't start using crack until 1987. I was, uh, but I was, you know, walking on the wild side, and and I got I got uh, into trouble. I I, I became obsessive. I, it, it almost destroyed my life. Uh, I was spending hundreds of dollars a day. I was going into godforsaken places. I was taking unimaginable risks. Uh, and I just wanted to get high. I just wanted another hit. Uh, I had a loving wife at home who stuck through this awful period in my life and stuck by me. My late uh, wife, Linda Lowry, the economist who passed away in 2011, uh, but who was with me through this ordeal. And I ended up, I ended up an inpatient in a mental hospital. Uh, I, when I came out, I relapsed and went back to use it. You know, I could go on. The book is there. I, I've chronicled the struggle in detail. You ask me what lessons do I draw or whatever. It, it, what can I say to somebody who might be confronting, like your friend, this this awful uh, challenge? Uh, get help. I mean, th these are going to be platitudes here. Uh, don't stop trying. Uh, my friend, the a great economist, Nobel laureate, now deceased, Thomas Schelling, whom I uh, discuss at length in the book, was a student of, among other things, of smoking uh, behavior. He had an institute for the study of smoking behavior at uh, Harvard when he was uh, interested in those uh, questions and did empirical studies of, you know, efforts to stop smoking that were con confined to the time in the, this has been in the mid 1980s when he was doing this work, but that were, uh, that were interesting. And one of the things they learned is that oftentimes uh, the failure rate on people who try to quit is pretty high. I don't know if it's still the case, but it was then pretty high. You, first time you try to quit, you don't quit. You, you end up relapsing. But for people who keep trying, they relapse, they try again, they relapse, they try again, and who stick with it, eventually they quit. So mm. you can't quit but you may not be able to quit on demand. Mm -hmm. Don't give up, seek help. I mean, again, nostrums, it's a day at a time. The only thing that you have to do is not use today. Mm -hmm. Keep the focus on yourself. I, again, I, I hate the way that these things sound like platitudes, but I, I think there's just an awful lot of truth in them. Keep the focus on yourself. Uh, and uh, AA... In a community, support, treatment. Sorry, I didn't have a, a formula, a magic formula for you there, Coleman. Well, there is no magic formula. Maybe that's 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 the wisdom. Um, okay, so one thing you learn uh, reading literature on racial equality, on incarceration in particular, on crime, is that every expert agrees that really crack and cocaine are the same thing and should, should therefore have been punished the same way because they're the same drug. Now, I, that, I don't... I'm sorry, was, were you asking me what I thought about that? Or? I'm going to ask you in a moment what you okay, think about sure. that. As someone, I mean, this is a... Uh, so, if you read the literature, that is essentially what comes back at you in, in pretty much one voice. But at the same time, you know, I've seen people on Coke, and I've seen videos, and I think I've seen people, you know on the street in New York that I, I'm pretty sure are on crack yeah. and they look very, very different. And so I'm curious, you know, like to, to what extent are crack and cocaine because they're chemically the same, therefore um, physiologically the same. And uh, what do you make of the crack cocaine, the, the famous crack cocaine punishment disparity and so forth? I think, Taking uh, the same amount of powder cocaine and on the one hand, processing it into a crystalline form that you can crumble onto a pipe and smoke versus on the other hand, snorting it. The physiological consequences of the one and the other are very different. And, and I think if you smoke it, it gets to the brain. I'm not an expert here. I'm not going to be able to give you chapter and verse. It gets to the brain in a much more concentrated form more quickly 
so that the effects on the body are going to be different than if you snorted uh, the, the, the same amount of cocaine consumed in two different ways. That's worth noting. On the other hand, if I'm making law about trafficking and I'm aware of the fact that the trafficker can take the powder cocaine and easily convert it into crack cocaine, he can't go back the other way. Mm. Uh, and I have a different penalty for th the crack than the powder, that, that's a kind of discrimination. It is a kind of discrimination, but I think it could conceivably be justified. You could argue that the markets for these substances in these two different forms are very different markets, that the deleterious social consequences of the violence that attends the trafficking in the substances in these different markets necessitates a market-specific enforcement strategy that uh, differs and is more severe in the case of the crack than the powder. And you're acknowledging the fact that, in effect, those are the same substances, but in those different forms, they attract different uh, concomitant criminal behavioral patterns uh, which have different, uh, in, in the case of crack, weightier negative consequences for society and therefore necessitate uh, a more punitive response. I think a person could try to make that argument. It is discrimination, but it's justifiable discrimination. But from a point of view of consuming the drug, there's really no comparison between the two in terms of what it feels like to take it into your body. Crack is a much more powerful thing, going right to the brain, a couple of hits on the pipe, and you've consumed as much cocaine as you might snort in a half an hour. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so... I want to ask you about a, 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 a few different thinkers and your, your thoughts on them. Um, there's a longstanding uh, opposition between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, this is, in, in some ways, I view it as the foundation between the foundation of the debate between black liberals and black conservatives. Um, where, you know, Booker T. Washington represents this you might call it skills first or economics first approach that prioritizes that, that looks at a population that is just, uh, you know, you know, in, in his lifetime been slaves and says number one on our priority, uh, number one on our priority should be to get our house in as, as, as top order as it, uh, as it can possibly be to, educate ourselves in skilled trades to, um, to, you know, make up for the human capital de deficit that was caused by hundreds of years of enslavement and by the fact that we've, uh, that, that white Americans have a huge head start. And then further down the list, we will worry about the fact that we can't vote yet. The fact that, um, we're not allowed in certain places in society that will come but the really hard thing is number one on the list, and therefore that's that that should be the main focus. Whereas W. B. Du Bois, you know, I'm I'm, I, I'm probably oversimplifying this somewhat, somewhat, but has the opposite view that the politics first approach. First, we've got to worry about the fact that we can't vote. We have no say in a democratic society, and therefore policy is going to be you know, inevitably bent against us until we have a say. First, we've got to, we've got to do that, and then the rest will follow. Um, I'm curious, what uh, do you view that as I do as kind of, so, in some way, the crux of the debate between black conservatives and liberals, and how do you think history has been to those two philosophies and those two figures? Uh, I do. Uh, I think you put it very well. <clears throat> when uh, Clarence Thomas was appointed to the Supreme Court by George Herbert Walker Bush in 1991, uh, Thurgood Marshall had uh, stepped down from the court. Uh, uh, I wrote an essay that was published in First Things and reprinted in my collection one by one from the inside out. Uh, the essay was called Two Paths to Black Progress. And I was moved to recall the debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois in the early part of the 20th, late 19th, early 20th century. Of course, Du Bois was only one of a whole class of educated uh, Negroes who were 
powerfully offended by uh, Booker T. Washington's willingness to compromise with segregation and to focus on development. Um, I, I think you put it very well. That that was what he was about. He was about the fact that slavery was slavery, and we have to come. What was this book called? Up from slavery. We have to make ourselves fit for equal citizenship. I mean, that's a whole. I mean, you can't even enunciate the sentence today without a cringing. But because it accepted to some degree the racist narrative that blacks were unfit, that we were unter mentioned. Uh, that, that that we were doomed to perish in the uh, competition of uh, the social Darwinistic competition of modernizing society because we were unfit. And uh, Booker T was saying, man, if you don't know how to read, you don't know how to read. If you don't know how to hoe and grow a crop in the land, you don't know how to do that. You had better get your stuff together. You, 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 uh, your behavior your values, the institutions within your own community. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. That, that's an anachronism, but that's because you know, that's Jordan Peterson. Uh, but, but that's what he was saying. And Du Bois was saying uh, that that was uh, uh, contemptible because uh, the first question should be equal rights. And they definitely were not uh, subject to equal rights uh, when Booker T was preaching his development strategy. But I'm sorry, I, I wonder, I ramble a little bit. You ask me whether or not I affirm that as a, a central uh, opposition in Black political history, and I do. And how do I think that they have fared? Well, uh, the NAACP, uh, the Howard Law crew, the Brown decision, uh, the success of the civil rights movement, the uh, culminating in the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr., who stands doesn't he, in that tradition that Du Bois was championing of petitioning for equal citizenship, uh, they got a lot to their credit. You could even argue that's a necessary condition to the full satisfactory culmination of Booker T. Washington's program. You can make yourself fit, but if you don't have a place at the table, it doesn't do you nearly as much good as if you did have a place at the table. You could say those are complementary strategies. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure it's uh, productive for us to kind of, in an anachronistic fashion, project backwards, what if, what if. Uh, I do think that the uh, Du Bois tradition is noble. Uh, I mean, Du Bois himself evolved uh, in his own intellectual and political and philosophical posture. He was a Marxist uh, at, at the end of his life and an expatriate. And I'm not sure I follow him all the way, but I would follow him far enough to think that petitioning and advocacy for equal rights was an central, um, a fundamentally important project. But I, I think now, <laughs> it, it may seem funny to say so, but I think now, good old Booker T. Washington's sensibility, we need to focus on developing our capacities to compete effectively in the modern world. That's much more important than further petitioning for equal rights, in part because we have equal rights, as a matter of fact. Uh, you're one of the people, the young writers of our uh, time, who has, I think, been most effective in making that point clear. Yeah. Okay, so a few more questions before I let you go. Um, how important was Thomas Sowell in your intellectual development? And were, were you aware of him when he was you know, writing papers in the 70s? Did you meet him? Did you mingle with him? So forth. I did. I was aware of him, and I did read him, and he was very important. Now, the way I came up, my teachers were all Keynesian, Democrat, left-of-center economists when I was at Northwestern. And when I got to MIT, they were a little bit less political, but the, the political sensibility was basically center-left, uh, the center-left of the Democratic Party kind of thing. And both the tradition that Seoul was steeped in, the Chicago School, and the particular things that Soul was writing, uh, which were uh, very much in keeping with what he wrote over the course of his entire life, which is that, uh, you know, basically the government is not the answer and that the uh, equal rights problem has largely been uh, solved and that uh, you can't expect uh, equal outcomes uh, when you have groups with different cultures and histories that, and that the world is full of examples of multiracial societies and in none of them do you see what it is that people seem to take as a uh, 
uh, appropriate goal for policy in, in this society when they talk about race and racial discriminations and so forth. Those ideas were at play. Uh, but when I encountered those ideas, I encountered them under the direction of people who were hostile to, to Soul's politics and hostile to the intellectual tradition that he exemplified. The Chicago School of Belief in Free Markets and Capitalism in uh, the, you know, Gary Becker, the great Gary Becker, Nobel laureate, uh, economist, now deceased, uh, his book in the 1950s, The Economics of Discrimination, uh, which basically argued free markets, open trade and competition unfettered without government uh, interference could be counted upon to work and wither, whittle away at and ultimately undermine uh, structures of racial discrimination and ought to be given an opportunity to do so, the, this kind of idea. Uh, and that was an anathema to the people who were teaching me. And therefore, I looked askance at soul. I, I'm sorry, it took a long time to get around to saying soul was a bad guy, bad soul, bad soul. He was the Negro you did not want to be. You, you don't want to be that kind of guy. You know, he's a black economist, but he's not really black. I mean, that's mm -hmm. literally what people were saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm afraid to have to report, if I'm honest with you, that I bought into that uh, for a long time. And, I, and you know, Soul's books were pouring out and I would glance at them. I can remember in 1982, I think it was, his big book, Ethnic America, A History, where he has chapters on the, on the Irish and on the, uh, you know, Italians and on the blacks and on the whatever, whatever. And he goes through... And the sneer from the historians at Harvard, I had just come to Harvard in 1982. That's not real history that, you know, and I, I, I bought into that. But Brother Soul has continued to produce the books and uh, Brother Lowry has continued to be attentive. Uh, and over the uh, fullness of time, uh, you know, Soul is ahead of the pack by a substantial margin. Uh, his great book, Knowledge and Decisions, mm -hmm. shows him to be a mind for the ages. He's Hayekian, and uh, he's, he's in conversation with the greats in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, his uh, uh, Affirmative Action, A Worldwide Disaster, or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the title of this book is, but uh, where he surveys, you know, he goes to Malaysia, he, he, he goes to uh, India, he go, you know, uh, he, he looks at what has been wrought by affirmative action where it's been tried all over the world. And he adds value to the conversation uh, and, and more uh, migration and culture. I mean, you know, there are these books. I mean, Soul is, you know, a towering figure at the end of the day, Du Boisian in his intellectual impact, literally. Uh, so I sold him short, but I came around. And did you have actual interactions with him? Not much. I've met Tom Soul once. Oh. Uh, I was out at Stanford for something. He was at the Hoover Institution. And I mean, he's, you know, well into his 90s now. He was, this would have been 25 or 30 years ago. He was much more nimble and he invited me to coffee. Hmm. And, and we had a chat. I mean, I had gotten his attention and I was impressed. I was, you know, flattered, in fact. Uh, and, and we talked. Uh, about this and that. I, I don't remember the substance of the conversation. It was a long time ago. It was it was entertaining and uh, interesting. Uh, but uh, I can say this. Uh, he has a recent book on charter schools, and he sent me a signed copy of it. And then a couple of weeks later, in the mail uh, uh, at my office arrived one of these tubular uh, packaging which when I opened and unfurled, I found a photograph of the Tribune building, which is one of these, uh, the Wrigley building, the Wrigley building, which is one of these great architectural uh, sites in Chicago that Thomas Sowell had taken himself with a note. And the note said, I wanted to uh, give you this. I'm going through my things. I'm getting old. I'm going through my things. And I decided that I need to give away some stuff. And some of it is I'm a photographer. I love taking photographs and whatnot. And so I'm giving away some of my photos and I want you to have this one. Wow. And I thought, even though we don't really have a relationship, we kind of do have a relationship because we're laboring in the same vineyard in terms of our writing and our thinking. And uh, that was his way of telling me that he had some respect for what I had been doing. And, you know, he wanted to share something with me. And I really, really appreciated it. Right. There is this, there's this thing where you can end up feeling close to people that, that you haven't actually spent any time with because you've read them and they've read you and you're fighting from the same trench, you know, in different locations and in different ways. And 
I yeah. feel that with you. I feel that with John McWhorter, Camille Foster, Thomas Chatterton Williams, many other people. Sometimes this is described as as heterodox, which I don't think is is necessarily the best word to capture it. It's kind of vague. I'm never quite sure what that word means. But I, I think it was uh, John who said um, he was at some kind of conference with with Shelby Steele, and maybe, maybe you were there. And you know, the idea was floated to kind of form some kind of formal group. But he knew it would never happen because what selects for being the this kind of black person is precisely a kind of non-joining mentality that that you know it's a catch twenty two. It's you know the same people that didn't join that resisted all the pressures to join the dominant culture of of black intellectual thinking are not likely to become cohesive club creators and joiners yes. when they all find each other. So it's it's kind of a paradox of why you know why it's difficult to organize around the kind of ideas that we share in common. Yeah, I've I've heard John uh, tell that uh, make that argument, and no, I was not at that particular meeting. And I, I would prefer iconoclast to heterodox, you know. I and I and I think that suggests what John is getting at here. The iconoclast is the person who is willing to smash the icon, who's willing to go against the normative. Uh, uh, orientation of right thinking people and ask the question that, you know, raise the f- forbidden fact, uh, point out the elephant in the room, kind of, you know, show me, you know, demand that an argument be made for something that's been taken as a, as a given. Uh, and maybe that does militate against, uh, against the club. We, but, but uh, I feel a certain fellowship with this c- collection of people whom you just got through naming. So we're, we're informally, linked together somehow. And we should argue with each other, by the way. Uh, yeah. That that could be productive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, finally, John McWhorter, what is it that brought you and John together? I mean, your, your collaboration going back, what is it, 20 years now? Oh, it goes back to 2007, so it's like 17 years. Yeah. Uh, coming up on 17 years. I, I first became aware of John from his book, Losing the Race, which was published in 2000. I didn't like it. I, at that time in my life, I was kind of drifting left. And uh, John was a cannon blast of clarity and defiance, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, in the race conversation. And everybody was taking shots at him, and I was one of the people who were taking shots. He came through Harvard. I was at Boston University at the time, but, I, you know, Harvard was right across the street. I'd go over and listen to some of his lectures, and I was unconvinced uh, with, with his various arguments and uh, thought him, however, a worthy conversation uh, antagonist or counterpart. So when Robert Wright, uh, the bloggingheads.tv proprietor, invited me to develop a show for his platform, which has become The Glenn Show, my podcast, now at Substack, um, and YouTube. Uh, but, uh, when Bob Wright invited me, uh, I thought John would be a good person to have as a, as a, uh, interlocutor for some conversations, not perhaps every other week, which is what we've evolved to, but from time to time. And we, we developed, uh, the habit during the 2007, 08 presidential election cycle when Obama, Obama emerged and defeated Hillary Clinton first for the Democratic nomination and then went on to defeat uh, John McCain. Uh, that, uh, you know, we, we, we began to have these conversations. Uh, they took off. We had chemistry. Uh, we bounced off of each other very well. I started out to his left, but I think I've ended up to his right. Uh, I'm, he, he's probably the same guy. I've just probably been coming to my senses and drifting right over the years or whatever. But, but uh, we had this chemistry and we developed this kind of shtick. We're the black guys. We're the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. Race is our beat. We're, we're talking about race. Uh, and uh, notwithstanding the initial differences in our political orientations, there was this common commitment to iconoclasm, what I'm saying, to, you know, cutting through uh, the grift and, and, and the, the nonsense and, and, you know, as it were, calling a spade a spade. 
Uh, and uh, while we have bobbed and weaved in terms of where we come out on this or that issue, uh, that uh, the quality of conversation and commitment to challenging uh, nostrums uh, has, has, uh, that we have in common uh, has sustained us. So here we are. All right. So with that, thank you so much, Glenn. This was a great interview. The book is even better. Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. Glenn Lowry, thank you so much for doing my show. My pleasure, Coleman. Good to be with you. Yeah.